And we'll start in a few minutes. <clears throat> I'll give it uh, around one to two more minutes and then we'll begin. Awesome, thanks for joining everyone. My name is Francisco Toro with the Solution Engineering Team. Uh, today we're gonna go over the oil and gas applications. Um, if you're just joining in, um, I've sent a link in the, uh, in the chat. So if you wouldn't mind just kind of filling that in uh, as we go to assess your knowledge of the industry. Um, so yeah, thanks, let us begin. So as mentioned, we're going to be going over the oil and gas applications. Um, we're going to specifically talk about the uh, oil and gas operations and some of the applications that this uh, includes would be the tank inspection, emergency response, uh, leak detection, and some of the advantages that we have uh, using uh, UAV drones in this space uh, and specifically comparing it with the traditional method. So first, let's go over the uh, oil and gas operations. So uh, oil and gas is mainly compromised of, in three, uh, of three stages. It's the upstream, the midstream, and the downstream. So the upstream consists of the discovering and extraction phase. Um, next, we have the midstream, which is the transportation and storage of oil and natural gas. And finally, we have the downstream, which is the distribution of refined oil and natural gas to its end users. So in the United States, for the most part, we are seeing uh, the, UA the use of UAVs in the midstream application. Uh, we're also seeing it a bit in downstream, uh, but again, for the most part, midstream. And which is, this is why we'll be focusing on, on this portion for the rest of this presentation. So the first use case is tank inspection. Um, so as many of you know, lots of refineries have, they can have hundreds of tanks, especially the larger ones. Um, and these require inspection. So depending on the refinery, they may inspect it on a weekly basis, monthly basis, or yearly basis. Um, and one thing that they have to note is the, uh, to, they have to make sure that the tank is not uh, leaking anything, um, that there's no tears or corrosions. Uh, and this, the reason for this is because they may get a, a large fine from the EPA if something is found from, uh, from that, that would cause this. So uh, it also poses an environmental, um, and it, well, in addition to the environmental damage, it would also pose a health and safety hazard for its uh, employees that are near the equipment. So in order to prevent this, uh, proper maintenance is, uh, is done. And the way that this is done is an inspector can uh, visually check the tanks. So um, this on itself can be uh, risky, 
because the inspector would have to go into uh, into a physical barrier. So you can kind of see it in this image. There is a, a there's actually a wall, physical barrier all around uh, all around these tanks. Um, and this is to prevent um, if there is a any sort of leak to contain the the chemical that's inside um, to to contain it so that it doesn't spread throughout the refinery. So that's the first uh, risk that they have to do is they have to get in there. And secondly, they would have to uh, climb any ladders or stairs. So here you can see uh, in this image again, there are uh, stairs or ladders that go all around the tank. Um, and also they would have to check, so they would have to check all around the tank, right? Um, and as you can tell, the stairs or ladders, they're not, they're, they, don't, they don't go all around the tank. So they would be on the ground either by using binoculars or just to kind of visually inspect with their own eyes. Um, so this is, this is the basics of the tank inspection. Um, next, we're gonna compare the traditional method of inspecting the tank versus using a, your drone. So um, in terms of efficiency, we're seeing uh, around 10 tanks per day can be inspected. Um, and again, the environment, it's, it can be a little bit dangerous because they would have to go inside of the physical barrier, climb things, um, and the equipment that they would be using for, for these cases would be, uh, they could use a binocular um, if they needed to. So using UAVs can be much more efficient. Uh, we're seeing that uh, the users can inspect 25 tanks per hour. Um, the pilot can remain at a safe distance. They don't, right, they don't have to go inside the barrier. They, they can fly at fairly low altitudes as required. Um, and then they could also uh, utilize RGB cameras, uh, thermal cameras, or even LIDARs uh, to conduct the inspections. And here I've listed uh, three drones that uh, we see uh, people in the oil and gas space using. So they, may, they might use the Phantom 4 series, uh, the M200 series with a Z30 or XC2, um, sometimes even an M600 uh, with the Z30 or uh, XT2. And um, we are also seeing some users that are more on the advanced side, um, potentially using third-party software uh, to, or even like PGI Terra, for example, to create uh, models of their tanks. But these are, these are very, very few uh, at the moment. So um, next we're going to talk about the, um, the, the pre-workflows. And um, for the most part, um, you know, it's very simple. Step one is just kind of preparing your equipment, uh, landing pad, putting it onto your vehicle. Um, then you can open up your favorite flight planning software and potentially check the local airspace and request a flight authorization as necessary. Um, because they're at a refinery, uh, security can be tight. So they would need to check with their, um, with their security team to inform them that a flight will be uh, taking place at the uh, tank sites, wherever they may be. Um, next, before launching, they just have to make sure that there's no aircraft uh, near them at the time of launch. Um, and I've added a footnote here. Um, so uh, in the oil and gas industry, we're seeing a lot of um, worries about our DJI pilot application or DJI apps in general. So uh, just be prepared to explain local data mode um, and what it does and also uh, potentially other alternative third-party applications. So um, if you, if any of you uh, find a user that's really worried, um, you can contact us and we could put you in touch with our um, with our government relations team to address any concerns. So yeah, so, you know, just be prepared. Okay, uh, next we're gonna talk about the workflow during uh, the operations of the tank inspection. So typically we're seeing that a two-man team is deployed for such flights where one person is checking the airspace and communicating with their refinery security um, as needed, they'll usually get in calls from, from other workers like, oh, there's a drone in there. Um, so they can easily uh, contact them and let them know that, hey, yeah, we're aware of this. That's our UAV team. So uh, the pilots would check um, the, the rooftop. So there's different types of uh, tanks. 
Um, the more modern ones have a floating rooftop so that um, depending on the level of uh, the amount of chemical that's inside the tank, it would be either higher or lower, so they can easily check for that. Um, they would check for any uh, any holes, any tears, any corrosion. Even sometimes having a lot of water on top of the roof can be dangerous, so they'll also check for this. Um, yeah, and then from there, the pilots uh, they would they can log or document um, the results. So we're seeing uh, we're seeing our users use uh, flight logging software such as Kitty Hawk, or sometimes they prefer you know more traditional pen and paper to to take notes of of issues. Um, and at, if at any point um, during their flight they get any uh, the ADSB receiver goes off and they and they get an aircraft that's nearby, they'll actually reduce the altitude of the drone. Um, to below 100 feet, and they will check for the aircraft. Um, so they have to actually find the aircraft before they can continue flying, which I think is uh, is very smart. So once they find the aircraft, if it's safe, they will continue their mission and continue checking the tanks. Uh, so next, we're going to talk about the post workflow operations. Um, it's fairly simple. They simply remove the SD card and uh, offload it to their local server. Uh, the inspector can review the footage as necessary to make sure that there's no problems found. Um, if, if for whatever reason a problem is found, uh, they can easily conduct a, a second flight and, um, and focus on the area that they, they want, just to make sure that there are no issues. So that's pretty much it for tank inspection. Next, we're going to go into the emergency response. Of, uh, which we'll specifically talk about firefighting. So um, the larger we're seeing that the larger refineries have a local fire brigade, um, and this is to quickly deploy uh, a team to prevent the uh, spread of the fire. So some common causes of, of fires um, can include, you know, the type of chemical that's inside. Uh, perhaps there was a lack of equipment maintenance. Uh, maybe some unseen corrosion or a uh, malfunctioning equipment or other electrical hazards that could that could spark something like this. Um, so what we're seeing right now is uh, even the large refineries, they may not have access to a helicopter. Um, and this is actually quite important for those of you that that are familiar with like even public safety, right for situational awareness. So here on the picture on the right, you can see, uh, a drone has been deployed um, to kind of assess the situation, and as you can tell, the fire the fire is getting pretty bad. Uh, but by having a drone, we'll see in the next slides how advantageous this can be. So let's talk about the traditional method versus using a drone. So traditionally, um, the local fire brigade may be uh, too close or in the danger zone of the fire to to safely monitor the situation. Um, and also due to the extreme temperatures, other equipment may be compromised. Um, other tanks may start to get really, really hot and then, you know, it can also catch on fire. Um, so this can be quite dangerous. Um, and typically what we've seen is firefighters would rely on local support to help monitor the overall situation. This could include like um, news helicopters to help them kind of see where things are. But again, like when a fire starts, right? I mean, everyone knows you kind of have to, the sooner you can get information, the better. Um, so using a UAV, it, the pilots, pilots and the fire brigade can uh, work closely to monitor at a safe distance. Um, the pilot can keep the drone as close as possible um, without risking any human life. And they can get fairly low in altitude, depending on the fire, um, using uh, RGB cameras or thermal cameras. So uh, one of the most common uh, drones that we're seeing to be used in when something like this happens could be like the M200 series with either an XT1 or XT2 with a Z30. So let's talk about the uh, pre-operations. Um, it's pretty much fairly the, the same as a tank inspection. Um, check equipment, make sure you're authorized to fly, contact security, uh, check airspace, and um, yeah, depending on their, their workflows, yeah, they, they might use the DJI Pilot app, they might use something else. 
But um, in any case, on the on the right side here, we have an image where a drone was deployed uh, in an emergency. And here uh, you could see that um, there, there is a, a fire going on and it's kind of spilling over. Um, so I, I might have not mentioned this before, but there, the physical barrier uh, would house several tanks. So as you can see, there's no actual uh, physical barrier between. Um, and here you can kind of monitor to, to see how this is spreading. You know, maybe this tank could get, could get uh, hotter and then this could also catch on fire. So depending on the situation, the firefighters may just observe. They might um, cool things down with water or, or uh, send out some other chemical to prevent it from heating up. Um, so here for the, uh, for the workflow during the operations, um, again, we have the two-man team. They will, uh, they will fly the mission uh, using the Z30XC2. They can check the tank's conditions. Um, and working closely with the fire brigade, they can help monitor, uh, determine where to put the firefighters, what to do, things like this. So this is the situational awareness aspect of it. So uh, actually in, in the image on the right, this is actually after the fire. So once the fire has been um, put out, or in this, in this case, actually the fire uh, it burned itself out, so they decided not to do anything. Um, and after it burned itself out, the tank, you can see here that the tank is fairly hot. And because there's, you can actually, you can see the, the, the level of the chemical, the, how much there is because it's so hot. Um, so in this situation, they, they're letting the tank uh, cool down and monitoring and make sure that, uh, you know, nothing will either uh, it will leak or um, just, kind of monitoring the situation to make sure that no one goes in. But here on the other one, you can see that this one also has um, some chemicals. And it's not as much, but it's still a little bit that is fairly warm. So again, situational awareness uh, is key in this case. Um, and the post workflow operations, it, there's, there's not much. Um, it's, it's again, kind of just remove the SD card, offload it to your local server. And um, they can review the, the footage and determine uh, their, if their actions were correct, maybe um, areas of improvement, things like this. So here is that same fire. So this is during, during uh, the fire, whereas the other image was uh, after. But yeah, this one got pretty nasty. And you can see here that they did spray some, uh, this might be fire retardant um, to prevent the fire from, from spreading to these tanks. But, uh, but yeah, it's pretty bad. Okay, next we're going to be talking about leak detection. So um, there are thousands of feet worth of pipeline that are both inside the refinery or inside of refineries and outside of refineries. Um, and similar to uh, storage tanks, if there's any leakage happening, um, the companies might be uh, fined for causing environmental damage. It's also um, a health concern. So proper maintenance is, uh, is very important. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's not as easy to inspect these. Like, as you can see in, in this situation, the pipe is actually uh, several feet off the ground. Um, so areas of risk include like having someone climb up and checking everything. Um, the pipes might not be easily accessible. They might be in brushes or by other electrical uh, equipment, uh, or it might be uh, near moving vehicles. Um, so let's talk about the traditional method of checking for pipes versus using a UAV. So traditionally, the inspector would have to either walk or drive near the pipe, and this can take uh, a fairly long time depending on, on the environment. So again, it could be, um, it could be surrounded by a body of water. Um, you might need a boat to, to check the pipe. Um, you might be in an area that's not easily accessible. So the method that they check uh, the pipe would be by either visually checking the outside, um, searching for any holes, damage, or corrosion. They also have, um, there's a piece of equipment called uh, a pipeline pig which goes inside of the pipeline and checks, um, checks for any corrosion, any damage. There's cameras, all sorts of sensors 
to check the inside of the pipe. So that's another method that they also have of, of checking it. But if they do happen to have uh, to find any damage on the outside, they would use potentially a handheld methane detector or a handheld OGI sensor. So those are the two options um, for checking the outside. Um, now, that's the traditional method. If you go over to using a UAV, um, it's much more efficient because the, the drone can check large areas. And these, uh, these missions are repeatable, right? So you can select an area, do it again today, do it again tomorrow. Um, so again, checking large areas is uh, much easier. Um, and because they don't have to be next to the pipeline, it's much safer as well. They don't have to uh, go into areas that might be risky. Um, and the method, the way that this is done is, uh, so this drone has the uh, U10 on there. So you can see here, it's on the, it's on the right side. Um, and this uses a mission planning software called Alpha One. And the sensor, um, the U10 sensor has a range of 100 meters or around uh, 300 feet. So as long as the drone is at or below 300 feet, um, you will be able to detect uh, methane. Um, so the mission planning software has, uh, you can create a mission, right? Just like GS Pro, for example. Uh, when you create the mission, it, it, it flies around and does the mission. If anything is uh, detected, it'll, at the end of the mission, it'll uh, generate a report to let the user know where uh, and what the levels were of the detection. So um, you could easily, once something is detected, you can go the, over there uh, by foot or vehicle or boat or whatever is necessary to kind of check, uh, double check that there is no leakage, or if there is leakage, you can easily address it, quickly address it. So again, uh, using the M200 with the Z30 and U10 payload, um, or you could just use the U10, um, you, could, you could do these types of missions. So, um, And because this is fairly new, um, we actually don't have any documented workflow, um, but this means that this also has uh, a lot of potential for growth, as a lot of companies are not use, utilizing the M200 series with the U10 methane detector. Okay, um, so that's the end of my presentation. If you guys have any questions, I can address them now. So I'm gonna check in here. Well, oh, sorry, I just noticed my audio was breaking up. Um, which gas sensors do you recommend for third party for the M210 V2? Um, so I know, well, okay, so um, the U10 is developed uh, through the payload SDK, so that's kind of third party, so that, that would be one sensor that I would uh, recommend. There's also, um, I know FLIR also just released one as well. I actually, I don't, I can't recall what it's called, but it would, they had it at um, Airworks and it goes on the M200 series. So th both of those sensors would work. Um, are there any other questions? I'll, I'll give it a few minutes if you guys have any questions. Um, this, this presentation will upload it to the dealer's resource page. So you will have access to this. Yeah, I'll wait one, another minute or two um, before ending the presentation if you guys have any questions. Do we need, so one question is, do we need ignition protected systems to inspect oil or lines? So I, I think it depends on the environment. There, there has been some, some, um, some feedback from our end users that they would like to see a drone that is um, ignition protected. 
However, uh, this, it's, not, it's not a lot of demand at the moment, and that would require a redesign of our drone. So I think until we see high demand for this, um, if you guys have any, any feedback on this, if you're seeing a lot of your users want this, uh, please let us know. But uh, that would be quite an undertaking on our part. So uh, yeah, we would have to see more demand from this side. Uh, this isn't, I'm not sure if this is a question or not. This is danger of UAV operation oil tanks. Sorry, Victor, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, let's see. The biggest concern I receive from government customers is data security. Will DJI produce a PDF document on its data security that can be shared with potential customers? So we do have a white paper we can share um, with your end users. Um, we do require an NDA to be in place because uh, we can get into a lot of details. Um, but this is something that, that we can share. So Jim um, and everyone else as well, if there are any concerns, please uh, get in touch with us. For example, you can get in touch with me and I can put you in touch with our uh, government relations team to help address any data security concerns. These are great questions. I'll give it one more minute if you guys have any more. <clears throat> okay, another question is, are there any updates with regards to the U.S. grounding all DJI drones? Are there any solutions to this? So, I'm not familiar of the U.S. grounding all DJI drones. Is this in, uh, respect, like in respect to government or defense contracts? I'm not sure if this is breaking news this morning, but I haven't I haven't heard of anything like this. Um, yeah, sorry, Kyle. If you could uh, provide some more information, that would be great. But as far as I know, um, DJI drones have not been grounded by the United States. Oh, okay. So William mentioned that this might be about the DOI and defense contracts. Um, so DOI. So um, okay. I, I think I would have to contact the government relations team about this. DOD will not purchase DJI, okay. Yeah, as, as far as I know, um, our team, we, ha we have a team in DC that is working on this. I haven't heard any updates um, on that front. But, um, but yeah, if there, is, if there are any updates, we would, we would put it on our DJI page. Um, and we, in the past, we had been, um, we had been working with DOI to address any of their concerns, but as you guys saw, it's, um, it's kind of grounded. Yep, this is impacting sales. Yeah, um, uh, if there are any updates, we'll, we'll let you know. Our, like I said, our government relations team is, is working uh, very, very hard on that. So yeah, they'll, uh, they'll let us know if there are any updates. Um, I'll give it another minute if there are any other questions.
Next question is, are there any shipping delays due to the coronavirus? Um, I, I believe there, there have been some delays. I, I don't know exactly the amount. Um, I would have to contact our sales team. Um, but uh, for example, uh, our Shenzhen office, most, most of our employees are working from home. Um, I know the situation is getting better now. People can eat in restaurants again, but um, yeah, sorry, I would have to contact our, uh, our sales team to determine if there's any delays. What about, so Jacob has a question, what about manufacturing delays? Again, um, I would have to contact their sales team. I, I know the situation is getting better now, uh, but I, 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 I'm sorry, I don't have the exact information on um, if manufacturing is being delayed. Uh, next question from Lucas and Kyle about the M300. There's no news available. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, let's see. Any other questions? Um, so the next question is any speculation as to when the news might come out? I, honestly, I don't know. Um, you just have to check our DJI website to, uh, to see if any news regarding any new products. Okay. If there are no further questions, we could, um, you can contact us, um, either myself or anyone else from the DJI team. My, uh, my email is francisco.toro at dji.com. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Have a good day. Thanks, guys.